from uh, the University of Birmingham, a most knowledgeable guest because she will give us information on uh, two uh, systems or proposals. Uh, the pattern grammar, uh, which I think is the one which uh, has uh, its, uh, I don't know where the birthplace, but uh, maybe birthplace in Birmingham and how this uh, pattern grammar meets uh, construction grammar, a rather newborn baby. So thank you very much for coming.
Yeah? Great. So, where was I? Yeah, so we get these small pockets of... I can't gesture as much. Uh, we get these small pockets of um, networks discussing the hierarchical relationship, but nothing that really comes together. So much less progress has been made in exploring the nat language network as a whole on a construction grammar um, th model. Uh, the idea of this structured inventory of constructions. Lingfeld says that the internal structure of the language network is still largely uncharted territory. Having said this, more attention is being made increasingly towards general regular constructions, like argument structure constructions in particular, so the scope of construction grammar could be said to be expanding from what was once known as the periphery of language, the idiosyncrasies, um, towards more familiar um, constructions, more regular constructions, the core. And this is where, really where we start to overlap with pattern grammar. So pattern grammar emerged out of the CoBuild project. This was a large-scale lexicographic analysis of English corpus data conducted at the University of Birmingham in collaboration with Collins Publishers throughout the 1980s and 90s, um, founded by John Sinclair. So um, this pioneering corpus analysis resulted in the key observation that natural language is made up of recurrent patterns in which lexical and grammatical information is intertwined. And so it follows from this came the insight that perhaps a word is better described in terms of its use, and this includes the syntactic environment or the patterns in which it typically occurs. And as a result of this, the Collins Cobold English Dictionary, um, it was the first dictionary where its lexical entries contained information about language patterns in which those words occur. Now, the Grammar Patterns series, which is also emerging from the CoBuild project, um, follows the pattern grammar approach to linguistic description, and it comes at things from kind of the opposite perspective, because rather than going by word, it is cataloguing the syntactic environment of lexical items, uh, of the lexical items in that dictionary, generalizing over the patterning of individual words to provide the patterns of English. And it identifies over 200 patterns, and specifically those that, that center around verbs, nouns, and adjectives. And then for each of the words, it, uh, oh, sorry, for each of the patterns, it provides the list of words, the list of lexical items that can occur in that pattern. And the, these words are divided into words that have a similar meaning. So they're provided with lexical sense information. So here's an example of the V that pattern. So claim that, assume that, know that, demonstrate that, and so on. So this is just a really small sample of a couple of uh, verbs that can occur in that open verb slot. And then we can have 10 meaning groups um, for the V that pattern. This is just three of them, the say group, the think group, and the show group. And then these, um, these numbers are, relate to the lexical senses in the Collins Co-Build English Dictionary. Now, patterns are similar to constructions because they are conceptualized as single coherent grammatical units. They have fixed parts. So we have that here, which is relatively fixed, and also prepositions. Um, open slots as well, like um, the verb slot there. But there are some differences between patterns and constructions. So, um, for example, grammar patterns seem to sit at a similar level of specificity, which is generally more regular and general than many of the constructions that have been looked at in the construction grammar literature. Hunston and Sue refer to them as mid-level constructions, although that term has been used for lots of different things. But basically what they're saying is they're not entirely general because they contain some fixed elements, in particular the function words like prepositions and so on. Um, and also they are not entirely specific because they contain some open slots which are largely <coughs> quite unrestricted. But there are also, um, the big, one of the big differences which, which I already mentioned, which is that pattern grammar and construction grammar have different origins. They emerge from different traditions. So while construction grammar developed within the field of cognitive linguistics, it is ultimately a theory of how language works in the mind, pattern grammar developed within the field of corpus linguistics, and in particular corpus-based lexicography. 
So patterns are perceived as purely observational phenomena. They're not assumed to have a psychological reality. It's purely descriptive. But that's not to say that they're inconsistent with each other. Both approaches are usage-based. Both invoke corpus data as empirical evidence. And it seems kind of surprising that until recently there has been little dialogue between the two. And I think the reason is really because of, because of the fact that the constructions or patterns of interest have been at different levels of specificity because the patterns are at a higher level of generality than most of the construction grammar literature has been working with. Um, just a couple of years ago, Ellis, Romer and O'Donnell um, published some research into the acquisition of verb complementation constructions, so fairly general constructions, by first and second language learners of English. And what they showed was that um, our grammatical knowledge depends on multiple experiences of recurrent patterns. And they used the grammar patterns uh, volume one verbs as the foundation for this research. They say that because of the bottom-up approach used, because it's not imposing a theory on the data, it's a, it's a corpus analysis allowing the data to speak for itself. And of its strong reliance on corpus evidence, the definitions of patterns included in Francis et al provided an ideal starting point for our analysis. So while pattern grammar is not a cognitive theory, while it's not assuming the psychological reality of patterns, the research can be used in construction grammar research into the, the um, mental representation and acquisition of constructions, assuming that the constructions and patterns of interest are at the same level of generality. So as construction grammar is developed towards more general constructions, we see more a meeting between pattern grammar and construction grammar. Another meeting of the two frameworks comes from a further, further change, a shift in perspective in construction grammar research, as we start to see an emerging descriptive field, uh, an interest in doing descriptive research. So um, this is the development of purely descriptive resources, which the idea is that then they could be used to test theoretical claims. So this is the emerging field of constructicon development. So the term constructicon was originally developed to refer to that structured inventory, the hierarchical network in the mind. But here, in this field of descriptive research, it's being given a practical application. As Descriptive resources, which are also called constructicons, these are structured repositories of the lexicogrammatical constructions of a particular language. And doing this work involves the application of lexicographic practices to construction uh, grammar theories, which Lingfelt et al. in the first book on this topic call constructicography. So we're really getting into the scope of pattern grammar here, where we're using uh, lexicographic practices and also some um, corpus-based lexicographic practices. And there are some interesting opportunities for using pattern grammar resources in constructicon development. Now, constructicons have started to be developed in lots of different languages, um, and they're at various stages of development. So the Swedish constructicon is probably the most developed, uh, but much work has been done on the Japanese and Brazilian Portuguese constructicons. The Russian constructicon is fairly new, as is the German constructicon. Um, the pioneering constructicon was the FrameNet constructicon. This is a constructicon of English. But the scope of the FrameNet constructicon was always intended to be limited uh, because it was designed to capture the idiosyncratic constructions that are not already represented in the FrameNet database. I'm going to talk about FrameNet in a, in a little while. But ultimately, it's, it's designed to have a more limited scope, and again, focusing on idiosyncratic constructions. More recently, the constructicons have had as their aim a move towards comprehensiveness, to the extent that this is practically possible. So, um, Yander et al., this is just a paraphrase, um, say that large-scale constructicons which aim for substantial coverage of a particular language are ultimately a model of that language. Now, practically, uh, the extent to which this is possible has been questioned. So, Lingfelt et al., um, they're involved in the Swedish constructicon project, so this is the one that has been developed the most. They say that a degree of coverage that corresponds to a major dictionary would not be attainable within the foreseeable future. So these constructicons that are intended to uh, 
be a model of the language, we see that comprehensiveness is a, a hurdle. And as a result, existing lexicographic resources, especially ones that attend to grammar patterns and valency structures, are becoming more and more interesting to people working on building constructicons, because if they can combine these resources and make use of them, then this would be the most efficient method towards comprehensiveness. Over on the other side of the coin, with pattern grammar, this has also been changing its outlook towards construction grammar. So Hunston and Sue reinterpret the notion of grammar patterns in alignment with the theory of construction grammar. And they say it's not the case that a grammar pattern is the same as a construction, because they talk about how a construction is a form-meaning pair. So what they say is that we've got a one-to-many relationship between what is called a grammar pattern and what is called a construction. The constructions, uh, there's, there's many to single grammar pattern. And they say that each meaning group within each pattern instead is what is represented as a construction, a form-meaning pairing. So they're deriving constructicons from the constructions from the grammar patterns resource. So what they say is that, as we've said, the grammar patterns volumes contain 200 grammar patterns, and, the, and Hunston and Sue work out that there are about five meaning groups identified in each pattern, sometimes as many as 10, sometimes just one. Like we saw with the VThat pattern, there were 10. And so they work out that the grammar pattern series contains approximately 1,000 English constructions across the two volumes. And ultimately, what they do in that paper is they offer them to construction grammarians as a way of solving what they see as the problem of construction grammar, which is that while a lot of work has been done, because a lot of it is focused on idiosyncratic constructions, it's not really progressing towards a systematic description of any particular language, in this case, English. And this takes me to um, a, new, a newly proposed project, um, <coughs> which involves developing a new English constructicon at the University of Birmingham with Florent Perec, my colleague, and myself. So we recognize that while patterns are similar to constructions, Grammar patterns provides a more thorough description of linguistic form. Um, its approach to meaning is less systematic. So in Hunston and Francis 2000, where they talk about the pattern grammar approach, they say that meaning groups are identified via a common sense atheoretical approach. And you see intuitive mean, uh, meaning group comes up. So because they don't explicitly pair patterns with meaning, they don't involve semantic role descriptors, and it's not a particularly strong semantic foundation. Um, Florence's idea was to use FrameNet, uh, the information in FrameNet as the semantic component for constructions based on grammar patterns. Um, and in the following slides, I'm gonna draw from this forthcoming paper, Perec and Pattern, where we look at, um, where we develop the proposal for an English constructicon using patterns and frames. So, yeah. So, FrameNet is really an obvious choice for the semantic components of our constructions because almost every constructicon, every attempt to describe um, the whole system of a language in terms of constructions is related to FrameNet in some way. They've all emerged out of FrameNet. Um, so, they either use information from FrameNet or they are uh, explicitly designed to complement FrameNet. And there are frame nets of different languages. So a lot of the Constructicon research has emerged out of um, the um, multilingual frame net project. So frame net aims, it's, got, it's a different kind of lexicographic project to grammar patterns. Um, it aims to describe the lexicon of English in terms of the theory of frame semantics, which is the cognitive linguistic approach to semantics, often considered the semantic component of construction grammar. So, a, a more, um, a more of a serious semantic foundation. Um, word meanings are grounded in conceptual structures uh, called semantic frames, which capture scenarios, situations, and experiences <coughs> that underlie these words. So in FrameNet, the pairing of a word and a frame is, a, is called a lexical unit. So here's an example of something within FrameNet. So we've got the coming to believe frame, um, and the definition of this is, a person, the cognizer, comes to believe something, the content, 
sometimes after a process of reasoning. And then we have this example, Sue realized that Bob was lost. So the relationship between the verb realize and this frame is a lexical unit. And frames make references to actors and props called frame elements. So this is the cognizer, so this is um, realizer Sue here, and the content, which is the that clause. Importantly for us, FrameNet also posits frame-to-frame -frame relations. So it's a network, a semantic network, um, which we'll use. So these frame-to-frame -frame relations can be of different types. So they can have an inheritance relation. Um, so this is a subtype relation. Lending, lending someone money, is a type of giving. Um, then we have a using relation, which is a bit like partial inheritance. If you offer someone money, um, then you are presupposing the act of giving, but because transfer doesn't necessarily take place, it's not an instance of it. This is where a frame draws on the conceptual structure of another frame without really being an example of it, a subtype. And then we can have a perspective relation. Uh, give and receive are two different perspectives of the act of transfer. Um, Actually, for us, the distinction between those doesn't really matter so much, but, the, but it's more the relationship, the fact that they're in a network. So in order to build the Constructicon, what we first need to do is to match up the two resources, grammar patterns and FrameNet. And we can do that partly automatically. So um, we've just looked at the grammar patterns verbs to start with. So we've got an automatic procedure using the XML version of FrameNet and an XML version of the COBOL grammar patterns, which was kindly provided to us by HarperCollins. And basically, it involves trying to match the verbs that are listed as attested, as attested in each of the patterns in grammar patterns with the lexical units of FrameNet. And basically, what it's doing is each lexical unit in FrameNet has examples, so like I showed you with the realize example, um, taken from the BNC. And these examples are annotated. Um, they contain the frame elements, so it tells us that this is the um, cognizer and this is the content. And it also has some grammatical information in FrameNet. So it searches these examples, and if it finds a match to the pattern, then the information in FrameNet is pulled into the co-build entry. So information about what the frame is, what the definition of the frame, what the different frame elements are. And sometimes more than one lexical unit matches a single co-build entry. So we did uh, matching for 78 of the co-build verb patterns. They couldn't all be matched automatically. Uh, things with dummy it didn't, didn't, weren't able to do that. So just over 40% of the verbs listed in these patterns uh, matched to at least one lexical unit in FrameNet. Um, so a limited amount of success for automated matching of the two resources. But the rate of matching varied a lot. So these are all the different patterns in the COBIL uh, grammar pattern series. And the rate of matching uh, really varied from about 84% to naught. Um, over here we've got a density plot which shows that a quarter of the patterns had a 50% or more match. But most of the matching rates were between 17 and 50%, and a quarter didn't have very good matching rates. So ultimately what we found is that automatic matching was possible. It gave us a head start towards building this new resource, but that it would involve a lot of manual intervention. And part of the reason is that COBOL Grammar Patterns has excellent coverage. It has more coverage than, than FrameNet. Also, FrameNet, because it's an ongoing project, it, um, it has some incomplete entries. So it'll have the lexical unit, but won't have enough examples for the automatic matching to search for the, for the relevant pattern. So it involved checking the results of the automatic procedure, identifying sometimes lexical units which were there in FrameNet, but didn't have any examples or didn't have the ones containing the relevant pattern. Sometimes there wasn't a corresponding lexical unit in FrameNet. Um, again, the coverage is, is greater in the Collins COBOL grammar patterns. Um, there are about 1,000 more verbs covered. So sometimes it involved just identifying an appropriate frame, basically making a lexical unit. 
And sometimes we disagreed with the match, not very often, um, but we reassigned it to another frame in that case. So once we do the automatic matching and we do the manual matching, um, and merging those two resources together, we've got the ingredients for a new resource. What we can do then is to look at all of the semantic frames that are associated with each pattern and then make generalizations over these semantic frames and that forms the semantic part of our constructions. So very much like Hunson and Sue's proposal, um, the same pattern, there'll be more than one construction for the same pattern, but our constructions won't necessarily match up to the meaning groups of grammar patterns um, because we're using FrameNet for our semantic information. So I'm going to illustrate this with a, an example of the VThat pattern, which we also talk about in Parekh and Pattern forthcoming, which is where we're looking at the semantic frames evoked by the verbs that can occur in this v verb slot and then making generalizations over them. And the way that we do that is by using what's already in the frame-to-frame -frame relations of FrameNet so that it's a more systematic way. So this is the largest network of frames associated with the VThat pattern. So basically, this is anything to do with communication. So she claims that, she um, suggests that, she comments that. All of these instances are in here. And this frame, these frame relations are just taken straight away from FrameNet. So you can see there's inheritance using perspective and so on. Apart from the one in red, we added that one just to capture an orphan. So um, we've got this uh, nice network. So from this, we would posit a communication via that construction. And we can also start to go down at different levels of abstraction, which is something that's quite, that's quite nice in this approach. So you can see that statement occupies a kind of a central position. And it may well be a prototype because these numbers are the numbers of verbs that evoke that frame. So you can see that statement is ev evoked often. And if you include all of these, which, are, which inherit the statement frame, around 28% of the verbs um, evoke the statement frame. They involve uh, verbal communication to make a claim, things like she claimed that, she alleged that, she um, declared that. All of these would be examples of statement. So from this, we can also have a statement v that construction. And we might say that other frames also warrant their own construction. So the request v that construction and the commitment v that construction. So what we start to build from this is an overarching construction and, that, and then constructions at a lower level of the hierarchy. Um, and we pull information of the grammar pattern, although grammar patterns don't talk about the subject, so we've added that, and then maps them on to meaning that's directly from FrameNet. So here we have the communication frame um, and the communicator, which was, you know, she claims that. She is the communicator and then the that clause is the message. The medium is if it was like her book claims that. So we're starting to build constructions in this way. So this is the second largest network of frames to do with mental activity. So these are all examples where what we've got is some aspect of cognition or um, some cognizer that has or processes mental activity in some way. Now, the reason why that's dashed out is because it's not a lexical frame. In FrameNet, it's just there to capture the relationship between other constructions. But because we've got this nice network, um, just these two were orphans that we, that we captured into the network, um, we can again have the mental activity via that construction and again go down to other levels of abstraction. So awareness occupies a central position. This is about ways of knowing. So coming to believe, remembering some information, grasping some information are all ways of knowing. So we can have the awareness via that construction. And then cogitation, which is about, um, so mulling things over, worrying, assessing, remembering an experience. So we can posit constructions as we move down through this network. 
And then there were a couple of smaller networks to do with perception and emotion. So from this, we're starting to build these constructions up. Um, and again, at different levels in the hierarchy. So actually, the FrameNet frame-to-frame -frame relations has done an awful lot of work for us in building up those constructions. All that was remaining in this case study was eight frames that were not within a network. So we've got things like the evidence frame. Others say that the outcome of the case confirms that federal prisoner number 41586 was bluffing. So here we have some state of affairs confirms this fact. The sign frame, where one fact indicates another. Um, a contingency frame, where some state of affairs determines another state of affairs, the outcome. So even though these are not actually within a network within FrameNet, we can see some similarities among these frames in that they all involve a relationship between two states of affairs or two facts. So we can, I'm not saying that we should, uh, we can abstract a, another construction, a relation v that construction over these. Um, but this one would not relate to a frame in FrameNet. It's just one that we've posited, deciding that there's a relationship between them. There are reasons for doing that. One reason is that because it's a descriptive resource, it would simplify the constructional network. It might also be useful for pedagogic reasons. Another question is whether we need an overarching construction at the VThat level, so right at the very top, that generalizes over instances. Um, there's quite a lot of literature in construction grammar suggesting that we make generalizations at a lower level and don't necessarily make those larger generalizations that linguists do. So this is an example of the network, um, an example of a bit of our constructicon um, relating to the VThat construction. So here we've got the various constructions, communication via that, mental activity, perception, I don't know if you can see all of these, the emotion one, where we've got the form and the meaning in those constructions. And all of these relationships are inheritance relations, so we've got the subconstructions here. Um, there's just one different relation, which is a horizontal relation, which we've used for the inchoative, coming to believe is the start of an awareness process. And over there, we've got the relation v that construction. That's the one that we posited. So the semantic information, fact one, fact two, is not from FrameNet. But what doing that does, having that construction does, is it shows that there's a difference. So these other constructions contain some, um, some human actor. So we've got experiencer, cognizer, perceiver, sentient entity, communicator, speaker which contrasts between those eight frames that were the ones between, that had a relationship between two states of affairs or two facts, um, the evidence frame and so on. So again, we can make an overarching construction here, the action v that construction, which has an actor as the subject. And then if we want to, we can have an overarching v that construction, although we didn't put any semantics in because we couldn't really see anything that was shared among the instances. But what we did with that work, I think, was we've got a proof of concept for the Cobill grammar patterns and FrameNet complementing each other. Frames can be used to turn patterns into constructions. And we've seen that while the automatic matching was not um, perfect, it does give us a useful head start, even though lots of manual processing is necessary. It's still really progressing quite fast for a constructicon. And while we've just been looking at verb patterns and illustrating this with the VThat case study, we intend to move on to nouns and adjectives um, to, to obtain comprehensiveness. And because our aim is towards comprehensiveness, to build a large-scale constructicon, we're calling this the English constructicon. And really, because grammar patterns is such a comprehensive resource, the, that constructicon would be unmatched in terms of coverage. And it would also be a different kind of coverage from most other constructicons because many of those, because grammar patterns look, talks about patterns that are more general and more regular um, than many of the other constructicon projects. 
And certainly because FrameNet was designed to FrameNet Constructicon was designed to complement FrameNet and not overlap with it as we do, we we assume that they would be also complementary with the English Constructicon. So we conclude in that work that a Constructicon built from patterns and frames would go a long way to achieving the commitment of construction grammar in describing the entirety of the grammar in terms of constructions. Now, by incorporating grammar patterns into our resource, we also have another unique aspect to our Constructicon. So, for each construction, we'll have the, um, the form, its relationship to the meaning, all of the other relationships to constructions, but because grammar patterns gives a comprehensive list of the lexical items that occur in each pattern, then we can also have a comprehensive list of lexical items occurring in each construction. And ideally what we'd like to have is, a, is an example of each item occurring in the construction. And that also would be something unique to the English Constructicon, because most Constructicons just give a, a few examples, three to ten examples. But this would really show the productivity of each construction. And we argue in, an, in another paper, Pattern and Parec, forthcoming this time, uh, that this would be extremely useful from a pedagogic perspective. So again, in the slides that follow, I'm going to be drawing from this paper the pedagogic applications of a more comprehensive English Constructicum. So this is moving on to, um, in addition to the usefulness of helping construction grammar move towards a more systematic description of English, Resources built from pattern grammar research, including our proposed English Constructicon, might be a key towards operationalizing constructional approaches to English language teaching. Now, this is not to suggest that nobody's ever thought of pedagogic applications for pattern grammar, because they're there right at the very start of that research. Um, in Hudson and Francis's book, which talks about what the pattern grammar framework is, they... Um, point to the pedagogic applications which are really about the relationship between Lexis and grammar. So because there's an interrelationship between the two, they say rather than teaching vocabulary and grammar separately, we can teach vocabulary um, through materials that encourage grammatical consciousness raising. And Hunston tells us more about what that means in her 2002 chapter. She says it's about making learners aware that patterns are important, encouraging them to notice and attend to patterns wherever they are met, to the extent that it's not only when the teacher draws attention to them. And she mentions some exercises that we can use. So learners could be asked to sort sentences according to their shared patterns. So we could do a sentence sorting task where we ask them to do it by pattern or by construction. Oh gone too far. No, it's fine. Um, and then the other exercise is that she says that learners could be presented with sentences containing the same pattern and then ask them to break it up into their component parts across a table and then being asked to abstract grammatical patterns from looking at these sentences. Now, um, a lot of this, these mentions towards these pedagogic applications were kind of... Um, forerunning what was to happen in the construction grammar literature because at the same time that Hunston was writing we get these sentence sorting tasks um, which are showing that native English speakers and learners of English choose to sort sentences according to construction rather than verb. So Tom gave Susie a book and Sue threw Alex the pen would be sorted together because they're both instances of the ditransitive. And then also we've got, uh, rather than preferring verb-based uh, um, sorting, where we've both got the same verb, but a different pattern is shown, a different construction. And also this research shows that the more proficient in English um, the learner is, the greater likelihood they have of using construction-based sorting. So basically this is showing the psychological reality of constructions, and also showing that knowledge of constructions is um, important for language learning. And so um, later on, in that same decade, is when we start to see the constructional approaches to teaching um, emerge, the, that body of literature coming together with we, home, and more recently, 
the contributions in Dunop and, and Jilquin. And they make several recommendations. So because um, in construction grammar, it's usage-based, so the idea is that we need lots of exposure to these recurrent patterns to learn language. A recommendation is that we enrich learners' exposure to varying instances of a construction as containing different lexical items, and we present them repeatedly in differing contexts. But Home also says that we should accompany this with explicit instruction ensuring that students notice the different instantiations and related shifts in meaning. Um, and his classroom-based study suggests that exposure plus instruction results in greater accuracy than exposure alone. But actually this, this idea of um, you know, making sure, making them attend to patterns, making them notice constructions, is very similar to what Hunston and Francis were talking about with consciousness raising. So there is a match. Another recommendation is that we should teach along the continuum between lexis and grammar and explore the relationship between words and constructions rather than teaching vocabulary and grammar separately. Holmes says words and their meanings should be looked at inside the constructions where they are found to occur and that teaching new lexis can be interpreted as an opportunity for looking at the constructions that typify its use. And he suggests uh, an exercise where you've got a table and you've got an example in that table broken up into slots, and then you can substitute items in that table for another, for example, another verb. And again, this is very similar to Hunston's exercise, where she asks learners to separate the sentences of a pattern across a table and to look at the components. So again, real consistency here in the two approaches. Another recommendation is that we should teach according to the constructional network. And this can be broken down into several different recommendations. So one is that we should teach constructions that are related to one another together. Another is that we should try and teach according to the prototype. So because give is the prototypical ditransitive, we should teach that first before we go into more less, less regular coercive instances. These are called path breakers. But Holmes says it's not always possible to find path breakers. So instead, we should be grouping lexical items into subcategories of meaning so that learners treat the construction as a productive group of connected category meanings and as fully productive patterns rather than one built around a handful of specific verbs. And he even mentions in that paper the co-build lexicographic research and says that that would be a way of helping teachers to organize constructions into meaning. So again, um, noting that it would help operationalize the approach. So the empirical and theoretical research of applied construction grammar is in alignment with pattern grammar and where pattern grammar has been pointing really from the beginning. And just more ways that pattern grammar can help to operationalize constructional approaches to language teaching uh, and this is important because while there's these literature going on about constructional approaches and what they involve, Lowenheim et al. point out that until we've got descriptive resources which tell teachers what the constructions are from a constructional perspective, one can hardly expect teaching materials to display a constructionist perspective unless their authors have had access to corresponding descriptive resources. So really that's what the um, constructicons that are being developed are intended to fill that gap. Um, but until we've got these constructicons that, that may have a more systematic approach to meaning, pattern grammar does fulfill a lot of the objectives. So these are just a couple of small projects that we're doing at the University of Birmingham, developing teaching materials using pattern grammar resources and encouraging a collaboration from an international community of teachers of English as a second language. Um, and the idea is that they can be integrated into a communicative approach. So we invite teachers to adapt the materials or design new ones and then share feedback and ideas. So um, here's an example of an exercise. Uh, that's another colleague of mine, Creighton Walker, who's also an English language teacher. Um, so he just pulled out a couple of, this is for elementary level, he pulled out a couple of verbs associated. This is the VN inf pattern and the VN2 inf pattern. So the contrast is working fewer hours allows me 
to spend time with my, more time with my children. So we've got uh, the verb, me as the noun, and to infinitive. And then my friends are almost always late for dinner. They make me wait at least half an hour every time. So there we've just got the V, N, infinitive. And again, asking the students to recognize the difference between the patterns and attend to the patterns in this very, very basic exercise. There are more interesting ones, but I just put down this one. Um, but it's basically an example of a consciousness-raising exercise, which is what Hunson and Francis were talking about. I've also been working in partnership with a trust of faith schools in the UK who have high numbers of students with English as an additional language, in fact, a, a majority proportion, and using pattern grammar resources as a way of structuring the teaching of academic vocabulary, um, and in particular, Coxhead's academic word list because their goals are to improve vocabulary acquisition as well as improving coherence in written expression. And what I'm finding is that what emerges is very consistent with a constructional approach to language teaching. And what's great is the teachers are already starting to make this approach their own, paying more attention to the local context of words, increasing exposure to words in different patterns, and encouraging students to focus on what follows the word. Uh, and in the UK, where grammar instruction has not been part of um, the UK standard education for, for many years, that's already an achievement. So, uh, but also, we know that the successful transference of research into teaching practice needs to be a two-way process. So this is uh, really encouraging. Once we integrate grammar patterns into the English Constructicon, we'll add more value because we'd have the pedagogic applications of frames to vocabulary acquisition. Fillmore and Atkins say that a word's meaning can be understood only with reference to a structured background of experience, beliefs, or practices constituting a kind of conceptual prerequisite for understanding the meaning. Basically, rather than teaching a word in relation to its synonyms, we can look at what lies behind it in terms of its conceptual structures. And it also helps us to contextualize how one sense of a word differs from another because they evoke different frames, for example. In addition, because we've got a network that we're building, we would be able to devise schemes of work organized according to that network in terms of the relationship between, um, uh, between constructions. And finally, we can also attend to another recommendation of the constructional approach to teaching, which is emphasizing meaning at every opportunity, providing motivation for the language system. This comes from applied cognitive linguistics, the idea that we need to explain to the learner why the foreign language should be as it is, and to promote the learner's insight into the foreign language system. So the Constructicon is able to capture some constructional meaning and some coerced meaning, subtleties of meaning that are not always quite so explicitly captured in frame net or grammar patterns. So I'm just going to give one example. I'm just going to not bother with that one. So the VDAT pattern that we already saw worked very well for our case study. It was very well behaved. Uh, now we've moved on to two patterns that are less well behaved. So the V-ing pattern and the V2 infinitive pattern. And while these patterns, these constructions, have a lot of similarities, um, they differ in ways that seem to be aspects of constructional meaning, uh, in particular to do with the V2 infinitive pattern. So an observation, of, uh, this is just uh, from Swan, um, but it's you know, standard, that stop with the V-ing pattern usually means to stop what one is doing, I stopped running, whereas stop with the V2 infinitive pattern, I stopped to rest, means to pause in order to do something. And that's captured in FrameNet with different frames, um, activity stop versus halt, which can then have a purpose. And also grammar patterns put, puts them in different meaning groups, so it recognizes the difference. But what we don't know is why. Now, once we start pulling together the VThat pattern with the network of FrameNet, we start to be able to see motivation appearing. So this is just a little bit of the network of frames um, of aspectual verbs associated with the V that pattern. And we can see that instances of the V ing pattern that evoke the activity stop frame are motivated. There are seven 
um, instances of lexical units that, use, that evoke that, that frame. They're supported by a number of different lexical units in the network. So, for example, finish, give up, quit, discontinue, and so on. But in the V2 infinitive pattern, we can see that, that v, the activity stop is only contains one verb that occurs in that, uh, that evokes that frame within the V2 infinitive. So we don't find finish to, give up to, quit to, discontinue to, and so on. Um, so it's less motivated. And actually, the verb that evokes the activity stop pattern with the V2, um, the activity stop frame in the, activity, in the V2 infinitive pattern, sorry, um, is the verb cease. Now, cease, with cease to, usually doesn't actually refer to a, an activity. It's usually cease to exist, cease to be, um, cease to have, which is really a transfer of states rather than, a, than an activity stop. So you can see, you can see how this network is influencing um, the usage as well as influencing these different shades of meaning on the other slide between stop in one, in one pattern or the other, in one construction or the other. So the network is, is adding something beyond the, beyond the two resources on which it's built. So what we're doing next is building on that case study and showing how we capture lexical and constructional meaning and, and, differ, and separate the two or help to distinguish between the two in the Constructicom. And we're trying to build this Constructicon based on verb patterns and then move on to nouns and adjectives. Although I should say that um, this uh, focusing on nouns and adjectives is one thing that pattern grammar has, which other lexicographic resources don't always do, certainly for ones in English. Um, the lexicographic and valency-based projects are very much verb-based. I know it's not the case here, um, but it is the case for English. Oh. And so, in conclusion, if I can go back, uh, pattern grammar resources are becoming more relevant to construction grammar research, even though the research started a long time ago. Pattern grammar resources offer great coverage and a unique characteristic for a new English constructicon, especially because of the strong lexical focus. Resources based on pattern grammar research can be used to operationalize, perhaps, the constructional approach to language teaching, and I think in the future, pattern grammar and other kinds of lexicographic and valency projects are going to play more of a role in construction grammar research and its applications as these shifts continue. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Great. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure how we will do that. Um, so with the V2 infinitive and the V-ing pattern, we've got a similar situation where they are doing similar things, but there's differences. And most of what we've been focusing on the moment is capturing the difference, and that being aspects of constructional meaning. But in terms of bringing them together, um, I imagine that we'll just follow... Um, the theory of construction grammar suggesting that um, if the two constructions have a relationship in form, then they'll be connected. In terms of relationships in meaning, it's more difficult if they're not related in form. Um, we were talking about horizontal links for things like this. Wanting to, certainly because it's intended as a descriptive resource that's useful, you would want to acknowledge 
that those things, for example, could be taught together um, if they are um, associated with one another. So I don't know exactly yet, but we're moving towards that. So yes, that's a good, a good question. Right. Yeah, the, the frames in, in FrameNet have examples where they've got lots of different structures um, which show, show the same frame. So they, they, don't, um, they provide the information about the valency, but you don't see it from that, that angle. You don't see a particular um, construction and how it relates to all of the different, the different frames. Um, for us, the frames is purely the semantic information. Um, it is relying on frames and frame net a lot, which isn't necessarily always a good thing. Um, frame net, as we said, it's, it's still an ongoing project, and there are lots of things that are incomplete and not necessarily things that we would necessarily agree with. Um, so I think that that's also going to be part of the project as well, is seeing how much... At the moment, we've been taking as much as we can from FrameNet, uh, mostly because, because it's there and it's allowing us to do all of this fairly quickly. But I think there'll be a large process of where we've seen things that we didn't want in FrameNet. Because, because as you said, they're coming at things from a different perspective. Um, so some of the, uh, the, some of the subtleties in the difference between frames that are very subtle, uh, but sometimes it could be because the FrameNet project lasted for 10 years, um, it could be that you're talking about two constructions, one from 10 years ago, two, pan two frames, one from 10 years ago, and one that was developed recently. So there's a lot of issues with that resource, but um, it's still a really rich way for us to progress. But I take your point that, um, that uh, it's not necessarily um, showing constructions in the same way. Mm -hmm. was about this advanced learning dictionary. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think what happened was that people were interested in patterns and then they weren't anymore. And then the Cobill research made people interested in patterns and it took off in a, in a different way. Um, just about the first point about, you know, what you're saying about the patterns being the form and frames being the meaning, that's exactly right. And as you said, the constructions are something else. That's been the difficult thing, actually, is, is, is matching them together and then seeing actually where is the constructional meaning, which is what we're doing with the V2 and V in um, one. With, with the V that, uh, it works very nicely. It doesn't really present any problems, but it does present problems with these. So a lot of it is about working out where is the constructional meaning. Um, and also there's the issue of frames, because frames, it's not just lexical meaning in a frame. So there's, there's a lot of things ongoing there. Um, which I think we're, we're interested to move on to next. So there's kind of, even though it's a very descriptive project, there's some interesting theoretical things coming up at, at the same time. So yeah, um, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, what you were saying about um, pattern grammar and um, the Cobill research being so influential at that time, um, but I think it's kind of, it's dropped down and I think now it's coming back up again. As, as things are shifting in construction grammar towards these large-scale resources and trying to make construction grammar have that reach, um, which, which it hasn't. It's had lots and lots of tests of these small, small scales constru constructions, but it's not really moved towards what does the, con what does the mental constructor can look like, and we need the descriptive work first. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So um, I think as we've been moving towards trying to work out what constructional meaning is, those case studies will be very detailed because we, we, we're trying to work out where the distinction is between, Lexis, uh, between the, the lexical information and the constructional information. So that's why we're, we're working on these um, at a different, a different level. But probably when it comes to developing the resource, we won't have the opportunity to be as detailed in all of the cases. So it'll, you know, form a meaning, um, trying to capture constructional meaning, but not necessarily... Well, the pragmatics, we've got certain things to do with usage, uh, but it's not explicitly incorporating that kind of information or phonetic information, um, although it could. I mean, this is the thing, is developing the resource and then other people may come along and, uh, and do other things with it. Um, but yeah, um, it's already a big project. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, um, well, I think because we've got the automatic matching, and actually the, the manual, once you've got the automatic match, the manual matching isn't that difficult. Really what it is, is the next step of, uh, identifying the constructions from the frames, which takes a bit of time, and making sure that we, how we differentiate lexical and constructional meaning. Those are the big steps. Yeah. Oh, yes. All right, okay. Um, no, 
we don't. So is it just telling you um, a, a degree of complexity of the constructions? Um, no, we don't, but it'd be interesting to find out more about it. Yeah, definitely. Yes, this, the pattern grammar, which I haven't really mentioned, um, makes some structural distinctions within that pattern and groups things according as well as to whether they're in phase. There's quite a lot of um, terminology. There's a little bit of terminology there. There's not much terminology in pattern grammar, but there's a little bit there. So there are some issues around, um, are we looking at the same construction uh, in those cases? So I've just used the stop as an example there. But actually, there are other cases of aspectual verbs doing similar kinds of things. And like I said, once you start opening the can of looking at um, the differences in meaning and looking at the network, they make sense. Now, whether we'll have to go back and say that some of them are instances of something slightly different, um, then I think, yes, um, that is a point to be made. Because there are some distinctions used in um, the grammar patterns series which we haven't attended to, some slight structural differences. I know that they were difficult for Hunston and Francis uh, and Manning to, um, to operationalize the distinctions, which is why we haven't really looked at that. Um, but yeah, it's a good comment. So yeah, thank you for the reminder. Pattern is really a surface string. So the idea of pattern is that they are looking at um, how a lexical item, a verb, an adjective, or a noun, and what typically occurs next to it. But the idea of it, even though it's got, you know, there's lots of V and ing and to infinitive, and they use terminology like that, really it's just intended to represent the surface form. There's not really much theory going into it. It's just that the corpus says that this verb occurs next to a two infinitive, this, you know, quite a number of times, so that's worth recognizing so that, that that happens. Yeah, I think that the, as far as I remember, the grammar patterns um, would treat them together, uh, would treat them as members of the same pattern, but as different versions of it. Um, but whether, whether they distinguish all those examples, I'm not sure right the way through. Uh, but I think that they would treat it as the same pattern. I think. I have to have a check. Because we've been focusing so much on these particular case studies, I'm forgetting what's in the, what's in the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. We we haven't been looking at those at those patterns. Part of the problem in in the grammar patterns is that the list of lexical items for those patterns are not comprehensive. So they don't give a list of all of the lexical items that occur in that very general um, pattern. So I think that we are skipping so far into the book and starting there, at least to begin with. Because as you say, 
it starts to become a very high frequency number of uh, words that can occur in that pattern. And I think that if we're talking about, I mean, you called them quite specific. It's interesting from the other perspective. They're very general. But, um, <laughs> but uh, if we've got ones at that particular level, we've got a kind of consistent resource um, rather than um, including the highly general ones at this stage. I think that's how we will, we will work it. I don't know how we're going to get around that, the fact that it's not a complete list of lexical items, so we can't really see the frames that are evoked in all those cases. And the frames will presumably be lots and lots of different frames. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you.